السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم So today we're doing part two of finding the true Mecca and I feel that uh, it's necessary to really examine the Mecca that we're told today in Saudi Arabia because um, there's a lot of problems, there's a lot of issues with that um, the least of which are mentioned in part one with a lot of references to the Quran and today I think because the Quran points to the world around us to observe and perceive the signs from God of things that are good, of things that are wrong, it's necessary also to examine our environment because anything that conflicts with the Quran, with you know what Allah is talking about, even one thing, it should become glaringly obvious that we're being lied to. So the first thing is that most people are familiar with this picture right here. This is known as the Kaaba. Um, and it's known to be in Mecca al mukarrima And the entire complex here is referred to as Al-Masjid Al-Haram. But not just a short while ago, it looks something like this. And you can see that it's, you know, something is a bit off there. Now, you could say, well, they're just, um, you know, doing some renovations or they're doing some, you know, reforming some changes. Fine. But to me, it looks like a wooden box-like structure. And the problem is that we're told that this is basically um, 1,400 years, even older than that. We're told that, you know, usually most Muslims are told that Ibrahim, the Prophet Abraham, is the one that built the Kaaba. And we're going to investigate this claim because nothing can be further from the truth. And evidence in Saudi Arabia today says otherwise as well, even by their own omission. So this is our starting point. This photo apparently is has to be somewhere from the 1800s. Um, and clearly something is going on. And there's many photos like this that show that this, this area has been modified many times um, within the past 120 years. So one thing that comes glaringly obvious is similarities to other religions. So there's this festival in Judaism called Sukkoth. And every year they make these large wooden boxes. Um, and they're called, each one is called a sukkah. And clearly there, there seems to be some kind of a connection to uh, at least several different religions, as if almost as if the same people that created these religions created the one that is masquerading as Islam in Saudi Arabia today. So basically, you know, you don't really, it's not that much of a stretch to see that this, these practices, these traditions that we're, to, we're told about that are so ancient and so preserved and the prophets and all of the messengers did it this way. How can we be certain about that? How do we know we're not just blindly following something we don't understand? This website shows, this is a Kabbalah student, okay, that shows similarities to this structure with this, and what is this, you may ask? This is what religious Jews put on their heads when they pray. It's called tefillin. And tefillin, it's basically a mandatory act when Jews pray. So, you know, the similarities are kind of also in the shape as well as the color, but obviously the, the drape around the Kaaba today has changed color officially across time so it's not just that it's just the idea that you know we need this type of a structure this shape for 
this type of worship, um, namely prayer. And what's interesting that if you look at the etymology of that term, this is the word tefillah, tefillah in Hebrew. Okay, what does it officially mean? Intercession, deprecation, supplication, prayer, hymn, prayer service, a type of prayer. What do they do in Mecca today? What is the point of going there? It's to pray. It's a masjid where people pray. This is the official explanation. So isn't it interesting that the word itself, tefillin, refers to intercession? That's the first definition. Okay. Now, in English, we use a term called phylactery. So this amulet, okay, that's literally what it is. This amulet is called a phylactery from Latin and Greek. And you just have to go to see what that means, phylactery, okay? It comes from the Greek phulasso, to protect. And interestingly enough, we see that there is some kind of a protection element there. And mind you, I don't have a problem with this idea. I don't have a problem with the idea that God has a sacred ground where people come, pay their respect, do certain rituals. That's not the problem. The problem is this is masquerading as what is mentioned in the Quran. Yet, it has a striking resemblance and purpose to what so many other religions, um, namely Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism. And I don't validate these religions at all. I think that there's a lot of deception when it comes to the organized religions as a whole, because they oftentimes all agree on the same history, even though they could easily, you know, try to completely prove the others wrong. But no, they all need each other to coexist. That's something suspicious to me, because you can't have these multiple faith traditions um, all being correct, clearly. But they could be all wrong. So this is, you know, the starting point to realizing, you know, there, there is something to the story. And when you look throughout the history of this place, this place has been devastated. This place has gone through so many changes and natural phenomena, right? In particular, flooding. So this is a flood apparently from the 1800s. And something that comes to mind when you read the Quran is the Kaaba of the Masjid of the Haram. Haram implies a sanctuary, a safe haven, a place you enter where there should be large walls, large defenses, fortification. It's like its own self-sustaining environment where you don't have to worry about calamities from God attacking the sanctified ground, the hallowed ground. But this has happened numerous times, numerous times. It's actually something of a problem because, yes, we understand Mecca to be a valley. But at the same time, you know, why would God not protect his most sacred place on earth? And I'm going to show you in the next part. Muslims today have narrations that suggest this should be way more sacred than it comes at first glance. Um, but we'll get there. I just wanted to mention that this flooding is something, you know, it's not just a one-time occurrence. It's not just a fluke. It was all the way back at the time of Quraysh. Okay? If you agree with this calendar, this series of events, how everything happened, Quraysh had to rebuild the Kaaba. So at the very least, this is a construction of Quraysh. And we'll see later that no, it, it's actually not even that. It's been destroyed multiple times. Okay? But the point here is, it was damaged by floods. 1630, flood, Kaaba rebuilt. Okay, let's go down the line here. So before the Prophet Muhammad starts public preaching in Mecca, 
the Quraysh rebuild the Kaaba. Okay. Then the architecture of Masjid al-Haram starts. Okay. Um, the Kaaba is burnt in 63 Hijri. There's a siege of Mecca. Okay. There's an aqueduct built. The Karmatians, another Muslim group, a heretic Muslim group from Ismaili Shia, they actually take the black stone out of Mecca. <laughs> then it's returned at a price. Okay. Um, you know, the Ottomans come to power and there's a flood in 1630. Then the Kaaba is rebuilt. Okay. Mecca is captured by the army of the Wahhabists. Okay. Wahhabists are ousted by Egyptian forces. The Ottomans are in power again. This has changed hands so many times, officially, in history. And only in 1885, we have a population of 45,000 estimated. 1885. So you're going to tell me the mother of cities, where all the trade happens, okay, is going to have only 45,000 people in 1885? We have photography at that time. How could there not be way more people? How could it not be way more developed if this is an ancient city? This has been there since Abraham's time. Okay, you're not talking 1400 years now, you're talking thousands of years, according to the biblical timeline. Let's look at other floods here. 1941, flood. Okay, 1969, flood. All right. I believe there is another flood in the 80s as well. So clearly this is not a place that's aminan, that's secure. It's not a secure city. It's, you know, هذا بلد الامين. It's not it's not the secure country or city. And you could argue, you know, a lot of things are due to human hands. That's fine. But remember this place belongs to God. First and foremost, that's what we're told. And they still call it Um al Qura. Um al Qura. And they only had 45,000 people in 1889, 1885. Okay. So let's talk about the Zamzam well. Everybody knows about this, this blessed spring that gives this very purified water. And I myself fell for this deception as well because as the population of muslims grew exponentially over the past hundred or so years what do we see is basically you can research this yourself but this is all that we have of this zemzem well there's just a marker so there was actually a structure that used to be here on this spot okay and it was all dismantled to allow and accommodate millions and millions of more people over the years to make Hajj every year, the greater pilgrimage. And so this is just a commemorative marker and it all went underground. And now we're expected to believe that that well still accommodates. The story is that that well is divine and it's, it's never needing to be replenished. However, you can check this for yourself. The well does need to be replenished. Okay. And it, changes its water level according to rain okay so if people are drinking rain water that's one thing but then they do also so many purification steps as well it doesn't just come straight from the tap and um i'll show you a little bit of that so yeah this is a spring gushing from the ground but that's not <laughs> that's not what they use okay they're not actually using spring water this is the well uh taken some time ago, maybe a, a decade or two ago. And you can tell that it's been exhausted, almost exhausted over time. Now, uh, this is a reconstruction from a movie um, or some cartoon. This is what they show you here. They have these kind of, um, they have these containers here where people drink this quote unquote blessed water. Okay, interesting that they reference this in the Bible, because the Valley, Valley of Becca, they try to um, 
<laughs> they try to conflate Becca and Mecca in the Quran, and you can't do that in Arabic. Becca and Mecca are distinct things in the Arabic language and as well in the Quran. They're described differently. Just watch part one of this series and you'll notice that as well. So basically, um, they have to actually bring up the water through pipes very deep inside. Um, and this is what they used to have here. Okay, this is the old building that they used to have that was up until 1953. And they would draw it out by a bucket. Okay, this is what the old well is in the museum now. And let me show you what they actually use. Okay, so the question is, how do they accommodate millions of pilgrims? How do they accommodate all the people that live in Mecca today? Mecca has apparently 2 million people now. Okay, well, it's from desalination plants. You can look it up for yourself. Desalination plants are very numerous in Saudi Arabia and the Arabian Peninsula in general. And these plants are some of the biggest, if not the biggest in the world, for storing treated water. So they take them from the sea. And by the way, the reason it's from the USA, also Spain, and also Canada, is because these companies that built these plants, they actually are from those countries. So imagine this. The Great West is allowing the heartland of Islam, okay, allegedly, to allow, to give them all the water for their people, for their infrastructure. And this is why they can pass this off as Zamzam water. Okay, there's no way this well is going to accommodate all those people. Not to mention how many sales of Zamzam water happen around the world, okay? They're just drinking desalinated, extremely treated water. That's all it is. And it's very sad because, you know, so much superstition is attached to this water, you know, that you can, you know, recite a prayer upon drinking this water and it will be answered by Allah. That doesn't work that way. You can't trick Allah like that, you know. So, you know, not to mention so many other stories and I'm not against the idea of a spring having healing qualities and being miraculous. That's not the point. The point is, this is not what we see in this place. Okay, This is why we're doing part two. So let's talk about the Kaaba, referred to as Al-Kaaba Al-Musharrafa. Okay? The most important mosque and holiest site in the Masjid, al the Masjid Al-Haram. Okay, It's the center of Al-Masjid Al-Haram, the Kaaba. Notice that they call this Beit Allah. And this is the Qibla or direction of prayer, supposedly, for all Muslims around the world. Interestingly enough, is the current structure, the very first paragraph tells you the current structure was built after the original building was damaged by fire during the siege of Mecca by the Umayyads in 683 AD. Why is this important? Well, what you're observing here can only be a reconstruction whether you think it's hundreds of years old or if it's a few hundred years old or a hundred years old doesn't matter it's a reconstruction and because that drape is on there you have no idea what state or how new or how old the structure is in fact it would appear that literally nothing from anything to do with the story of the prophet muhammad has any relevance in this Kaaba they have today. Okay, so already what you're looking at is a diary. It's, it's, um, it's basically a museum exhibit of what they are telling you happened and is the Masjid al-Haram complex of Mecca. It's a museum. It's a tourist attraction. It's a theme park, okay? It cannot be the real deal because the structure has been destroyed. It's symbolic at best. So they even tell you here it's been rebuilt several times. Okay. And they say that it's been built by Ibrahim and his son Ismail. But I'm going to show you that the Quran doesn't even allude to that. It's, in, it's interpolated into the text. So when you talk about the 
Kaaba was destroyed, rebuilt several times. Okay. Notice that people don't have a problem with this. This is from a subreddit called Art Islam. And it's a reminder for us to not get carried away that it's a divine creation. It's not about the Kaaba, it's about the location. It will be destroyed again, but the place won't lose its significance. Original Kaaba was built by Ibrahim alayhi salam, includes the area of the Hatim. Uh, a semicircle you see next to the Kaaba we know today. It's not the building of the Kaaba that is sacred, but the land it's built on. One prayer in the sacred land around the Kaaba, the Haram, is worth 100,000 prayers. Here's the problem with this. The problem with this is, if the Kaaba is not protected, what is the blessing of, the, what is the point of that land? What is the point of throwing money? And I'll show you later, this is some of the most expensive architectural projects in modern history. Why isn't it about the Kaaba? You're telling me that the Kaaba, okay, this is something that is supposed to bolster some kind of a stability. The very word itself refers to that. Itself can be destroyed numerous times. Something doesn't make sense. Okay, this is this is God's property, and anybody can come in and just destroy it. That has enough power in the earth. Okay. This is a quote. This is a passage from the Quran. So we sent upon them the flood and locusts and lice and frogs and blood as distinct signs, but they were arrogant and were a criminal people. This is in reference to the people of Pharaoh, people of Fir'aun. Okay. They were sent among these signs, namely locusts or in Arabic, al-jarad, okay? So notice that this is a punishment. This is a sign for people to remember. In the Bible, it's even a punishment. In the Quran, it was sent to the people of Fir'aun, people of corruption, people that deny their prophets, people that reject God's signs. And what do we see? We see the same locusts. Locusts haven't changed much since Moses' time to now. That they have descended on Mecca at least once. This is bizarre. I've never been in a situation where I've lived and I've had swarms of locusts, you know, envelop where I'm living. This, this is something extraordinary, if you think about it. Yes, I can agree in the warmer regions of the world that's more possible to happen, but not on the holiest site in Islam, not in the holy city of God, where the Prophet Muhammad preached. I really doubt that Allah would allow something as insulting, something as, you know, just does not, is not befitting of a sacred city, such as Mecca. And yeah, it, they were so big in 2020. And notice, uh, it said last year they attacked. So attacked twice, in 2019 and in 2020. Swarms attacked the holy city, making the Islamic sanctuary inaccessible. They had to actually get the government to shut down the place from locusts. Okay. So that's a sign to people that don't believe. And I'm telling you, it's something of a sight to behold, right? It's an all-out invasion of these insects. The floor is covered in them. The sky is dotted with them in broad daylight. Okay? They're, they were purported all over in 2020. Record numbers. This is unheard of. Okay? Now, mind you, they were elsewhere in the world. They were in India, they were in Ethiopia, they were in, I believe, Somalia. But in Mecca, this is supposed to be a sacred city. This is, Allah has a protection, a haram on the city. Okay? Just keep that in mind. This is sent as a sign to disbelieving people, right? 
And uh, I already kind of touched upon this, but this gate called the Benisheba gate is interesting because there is no way this gate right here is from the times of Quraysh. Okay. If nothing, I mean, even if we had something from the era of Quraysh, that would be barely existing. You're talking about 1400 years at, you know, around about of history. This was not made by them. This doesn't even resemble. This is something clearly Ottoman. Um, you know, like what, what we're talking about here is the authenticity of this place that they show as Mecca. Okay. And this doesn't exist anymore. They got rid of this. It was removed in the 1960s. There's no marking left where it shown to, was shown to exist. Okay. And... Um, they're saying that this gate was uh, the most prominent one for one of the seven entrances in the area of the Kaaba. This is also um, something we'll touch upon as well is Maqam Ibrahim. But I just want to introduce some verses about this. So this concept of Ibrahim creating the Kaaba or building it rather, it comes from this verse and also from outside the Quran, but this verse is used as an evidence. And I just want to show you what it says in Arabic. It says, يَرْفَعُ Ibrahim الْقَوَاعِدَ min الْبَيْتِ Ismail. Okay. It's, it's not saying that he built the Kaaba anywhere. He raised the foundations from the house. Where does it say he built the house? Where does it say Kaaba in there? Clearly, something existed at that time and Ibrahim elevated it. That's all we can say. And by the way, if you look at this word, you'll get an idea of what the Qawaid are. Okay? Just look at where that word is used in the Quran. And uh, you'll know that it can't be in that place in Saudi Arabia. Here's another one as well. This word Ja'la, Allah uses when He creates things, when He creates the night, when He creates the day. Anything in the creation, Ja'la Allah, that's something that He created. There's no way. You could say Khalaqa means created, but the attribution is to Allah, that He made this, He put this to be a, a reality for us. Ja'la Allahu al al bayt al haram. Notice here we have the word Kaaba of the bait. How can the Kaaba be the bait? Okay. And maybe maybe it's part of it. I'm I'm not too certain on that, but I'm telling you for one thing that this has to apply somewhere. Who's the one that made the Kaaba? Allah. This may sound preposterous because we've never even considered something like this, that there's a spot on the earth that is actually blessed, that is actually miraculous, that is actually a hujja, a, the best argument for God's existence and supremacy in the world. That we could even suggest anything remotely resembling that area today in Saudi Arabia could come to display and exhibit this verse. Let's look at another verse. This is something that today is regarding the standing place or the station of Abraham, Ibrahim. What does it say? Fihi ayatun bayinatun maqamu Ibrahima. Notice this maqam Ibrahim, it's supposed to be a clear sign clear sign of God. Okay? وَمَنْ دَخَلَهُ كَانَ آمِنًا This is talking about this area. Okay? That's what we're told. It's talking about this Mecca area. Whoever enters it will be safe. Well, clearly not if there's a flood or if there are locusts or if somebody burns down the Kaaba in history or if somebody steals the black stone. 
clearly it's not a safe place. And this maqam Ibrahim, I'm going to show you, this is nowhere near anything relating to a sign of God that's bayina, self-evident, not at all. The connotation in here is that this house is for everyone. The real house is for everyone. Um, I just call it a house. I mean, it's called al-bayt. Al-masjid al-haram is for mankind. It's for the worlds. We have to also keep into consideration that the Quran was sent to jinn kind as well. And maybe we can observe, you know, the jinn doing tawaf around the Kaaba. But clearly, there's more to the story, right? So, something I want to mention too is when we talk about the Kaaba, right? They refer to this as a cube, right? The literal meaning of Kaaba is cube. In the Quran, from the era of the life of Muhammad, Kaaba is mentioned by the following names. Okay. So, that's what they say, Kaaba means cube. All you have to do is just search what cube is. It's Muka'ab. Always was Muka'ab. Dice, cube, Muka'ab. It's a different word. Same root, mind you, it's the same root, no problem with that, but it's not Kaaba. It's anyone's guess what Kaaba means. Kaabain refers either to ankles or heels, it refers to so much, but Muka'ab, Muka'ab, there's a Shadda there, you can't see it, but it's supposed to be Muka'ab. That's what cube is, not Kaaba. And even the dimensions are not perfect cube anyway. But this lie that Kaaba means cube, it's not correct. Other shapes have this as well. Muthalleth, a triangle. Musaddas, a hexagon. Okay. So clearly, there's something happening here. Okay. So this is the Maqam Ibrahim. Okay. This is what it is. It is a golden cage whereby it's preserved thousands of years. I guess it's rubbed off in that time because people have, you know, touched it for so long. But this is what we see. Th that's the footprints of Ibrahim. Okay. And mind you, you just have to take it at face value. There's no actual evidence whatsoever. There is a scholarly tradition. There's everyone telling you that's what it is. But this is no different than if you go to India, they will show you the footprints of Buddha. And they'll show you shrines for all kinds of different saints or deities. Um, in the Islamic world, you have the same thing, the same approach. They show you the um, historical relic, but there's no way for you to test for yourself that's what that is. And your senses tell you Hmm, something is suspicious here because in that time there would be nothing left and they could pour concrete in there. We wouldn't even know. They could make it look very old and convincing and there's no, there's nothing remaining of any human foot imprint whatsoever. So it's blind faith. And to me, this is not ayatun bayinatun, not at all. This is something people will just look at and not think anything about. Oh, okay, it's just it's just a relic. That's supposed to be Maqam Ibrahim for everybody. Okay. So it's mentioned as a clear sign, and you know, there's a whole history about it. Um, you know, you can you can search this for yourself, but so this has been also modified as well over time. The encasement has changed hands as well. Um, it was only recently they showed detailed photos of it, um, just like the black stone, which we'll, we'll talk about soon. Um, but yeah, I, I just feel like this doesn't do justice to what the Quran represents at all. And in fact, the story doesn't even make any sense. Um, the more that you look into it. 
I mean, is this really a relic of Ibrahim's existence here on earth? This is, this is what we're going to accept. Okay. So, you know, this is what it looked like around 1930. They had this entire kind of a complex structure here from the Ottoman period. And that was quickly raised to the ground, demolished with the uh, new government. And they put it in this kind of iron wooden box. So you couldn't even tell what was in it for so long. And then basically um, used to be in this gold cylinder up until a certain point. And now it's in the current one. So let's talk about the stoning of the devil, Jamarat. Okay. So the stoning of the devil is one of the rituals that happens in the Masjid al-Haram area in Mecca. And basically you take uh, pebbles and basically you stone this obelisk or some kind of a stone formation. And it says it right here. It is a, supposed to be a symbolic reenactment. Why would it have to be a symbolic reenactment if this is the actual city Ibrahim went to? So they're telling us right now it's symbolic and the three pillars represent the shaitan. Notice it says that he didn't stone the shaitan itself. He stoned three pillars. By the way, this is nowhere in the Quran whatsoever. Just want to make that clear. And these three pillars represent shaitan. Now, here is what it started to look like. Okay, this is the first iteration of this pillar, this obelisk, okay? And this is how everyone has always understood it. This obelisk represents shaitan. It says it right there on the page. When you go and see what it is today, this is what you see, okay? And I'm going to show you how it's changed over time. So um, this is what you see. These are the three pillars now. This is what people throw pebbles at, okay? So this is a compulsory ritual for hajj. Okay, millions of people flock there every year. And this is what it was as well. And when you look at, um, this is the earliest photo, 1953. Clearly, there's something going on when they can just change at will anything what they want in this area that's supposed to be sacred. There's no change in the law's way. How could we think this has anything to do with the way of a law when it's constantly changing. Now, this is a perfect example of what it looks like. Okay. So this is in the earliest photo. It's kind of blurry, but I like this because it shows you all of the changes. Then it kind of went to this. Then we had this, then this. Basically, it's not even... this. It, barely resembles what people only a few generations did, uh, generations ago did, okay? And what's very interesting is I noticed that there was another structure that was recently made in the past few decades, and people question, hey, um, Sheikh, there's a problem here. Why is there a pillar on Mount Arafah? We're not supposed to stone Mount Arafah. We're supposed to climb it and recite supplications and prayers up there but you know what they said they said no no the obelisks never represented shaitan ever okay there is nothing in the quran or the sunnah of the prophet وسلم, that indicates that these pillars are put as signs for shaitan or the devil the fact that you found this in some books or former scholars or non-muslim sciences does not mean that it is the truth Rather, these are put as marks for determining a specific place and distinguishing it from others, in the same manner that people put marks on their land to show its boundaries. So, is this correct? Ibrahim stoned pillars that represented Shaitan. But not this pillar. This pillar is not an obelisk just happens to have the same shape. Nobody can explain what it's doing up there on Mount Arafah. Okay. This is the climax of Hajj. 
and they put the very symbol that they say represents shaitan. And I'll eventually show you why they had to do it this way, because there is a collective memory about the real place. And there is something analogous to this these rituals. There's a purpose for it. But they have dumbed it down and made it so simplistic and divorced from the real place and the real rituals. And it takes some time to unravel because it's obviously very confronting. But we have to get through this part first so we can show you why they have three pillars in the first place. Okay. Remember these three pillars too because there's another three structures that I'm going to show as well that's also in the site. Okay. And here we are. It's these ones. Have you ever looked inside, inside the Kaaba? Basically, 99% of people are not allowed inside. And what's interesting is, for whatever reason, there just has to be these three wooden pillars, and they're not the original ones, mind you, that hold up the roof, okay? Uh, standing inside the Kaaba, okay? Now, Apparently, these are one of the strongest types of wood. They were put there by the Prophet's companion, Abdullah ibn Zubayr. And the columns inside the Kaaba are more than 1,350 years old, and they're dark brown. I really struggle to believe that is 1,350 years old. Okay? Especially when there's a museum with that very wooden column from the time of Ibn Zubayr. <laughs> okay, it's in the museum. Even this, I would question the age of this. Okay. This is a severely deteriorated section of one of Beit Allah's three interior pillars dating back to the time of Abdullah Ibn Zubayr. This is a column from the same time, and this is a column is just burnt a bit, really. That's, those are comparable, okay? So, you know, there's there's something going on because the symbolism of this is not an accident. They even show you a model in the Mecca Museum. It says a somewhat accurate, depicts the double roof of the Kaaba, crawl space between the lower and the upper roof, the three pillars inside, the raised marble platform entrance to the right, the Baab al Tawbah in the left corner as well, and other features. In contrast to the red bricks shown here, Kaaba was built with black volcanic rock abundant in the surroundings of Mecca. More recently, it was reconstructed with granite. Yeah, we know the original one has to be something way more impressive, right? Um, but yeah, we know, we get an idea, yeah, this is a reconstruction, just like the real one, just like the one in Saudi Arabia today. This is what this is. It's showing you a cross-section of what it is. Is this something to be impressed by? Is this something worthy of the Quran revealing this information to us? Okay, For us that don't know anything about Islam or God or anything. So... Um, let's look at these clock towers. And I know this has nothing to do with the rituals of the Kaaba, of Masjid al-Haram, of Hajj. But when you think about it, it actually does have a lot to do with it because these clock towers, okay, is part of a complex where people are in a hotel, in a five-star hotel, where they can actually have accommodation necessary for those millions of people to do these rituals within a span of six or seven days, roughly. And you're talking about the whole Islamic world. Okay. So this clock tower, mind you, this is 300 meters away from the world's largest mosque, the most sacred site in Islam, the great mosque of Mecca. And who built it? Well, it says right there, the developer and contractor of the complex is the Saudi Bin Laden Group, the kingdom's largest construction company. It's the world's second most expensive building with the total cost of construction totaling $15 billion with a B. So 
um, you know, what's interesting is if you just look at this Bin Laden group, right? They have done so much construction when it comes to not just, not just, you know, the Arabian Peninsula, but actually the, um, the two holy cities. Okay. They're actually constructing Jeddah tower, which is supposed to be the tallest building in the world. Um, and when you look at it, what did they construct here? The Jamarat bridge, pedestrian bridge needed for the stoning of the devil. Okay. Al Masjid Al Haram expansion. And mind you, you could tell me that what's the problem? What's the problem with them expanding the holiest mosque in Islam to accommodate a growing Muslim population. What's the problem? The problem is this site has zero history. It has such little history, in fact, that they actually didn't even have enough space for all of those people. Apparently, space is very tight just today. If more people in the world convert to Islam, and are obligated to do these rituals in the future because Islam is just um, Muslims are having a lot of children every generation they're going to have to keep expanding so you would have to find out somehow way of explaining why Allah is this place is attributed wrongly to Allah when it doesn't even accommodate people that are going to be born in the future to me that is a conspiracy okay um so yeah let me just show you um another thing here if you want to if you wonder about why there has to be three columns okay the interior of the kaaba has to have three columns like this you just have to look no further than freemasonry okay because we already have these three grand columns already established in Freemasonry. And they're very well documented, very well documented. They have all the symbolism attached to them. They have all the explanation. Uh, it comes out of the Bible. And, and mind you that Freemasons, they have the copies of the Quran in Freemasonic temples, just like the Bible, just like the Jewish Bible. And... I'm not saying that the Quran advocates for this. I'm saying that the people that made this, people that made this, they know a thing or two about this. And the reason why is because they also have three candlesticks when they initiate Freemasons. Well, is that just a coincidence? three pillars as well okay this is very well known and documented these three pillars are also what form kabbalah this is the kabbalistic tree of life it's actually three pillars if you look at it closely this is how you understand this tree of life vaguely okay the three pillars correspond to the tree of life known as the sephiroth and the three great columns of freemasonry Freemasonry, Kabbalah. And you're going to tell me this has anything to do with God's religion. Have we been swindled? Are Muslims going there thinking they're reenacting the rites of the prophets when they're actually partaking in something very alien to the concept of monotheism? Something that is a direct threat, something that is antithetical to the religion prescribed in the Quran, the last revelation. We even have in Judaism, strangely again, this concept of three candles, three lights, three columns, three pillars. We also have uh, three walls here as well. So it's not just inside the Kaaba, it's also part of al-Masjid al-Haram. Okay. So the resemblance is uncanny. And the more you look into it, the more it appears there's something going on. Okay. 
So let's end this on the black stone. The black stone, interestingly enough, is not one stone. And you can argue maybe at one time it was, and this is the remnant of it, okay? But this is not black. This is sort of black, I guess. Um, and the idea is all you have are these bits and pieces. This is an interesting photo, eh? We usually don't see this photo. We usually assume the whole thing is black like this, right? But no, you just have these little bits and pieces in there, and they're molded in some kind of a, probably made of iron. Okay, now we'll talk about why iron is so important. And that's why it's rusted, but um, yeah, this is, this is what we see. And people think, oh, it's all black. It's just a singular black stone. You know, amazing. This is a sign. But this is what it is. Okay. And you're going to tell me that we're going to go up there and kiss this thing. And it's going to remove our sin. Remember, remove our sin. Do you know what an amulet does? Protection, inter interceding on behalf of a soul. Protection, amulet. When you pray, you wear a amulet. You're okay. You see, you see how it's. You see how it works, right? You kiss this thing, and you just. You're sinless. It's magic. You have video, as I showed in the first part of this series, of people running over each other. People have died on this expedition. And, you know, it just just seven years ago, there was a major, like hundreds of, I think it was maybe 70 people died officially, over 70 people. And... To me, I mean, it's just, it's very obvious. It's its a crowding problem. And to me, I, I can't see the prospect of a place that's sanctioned by the creator of the heavens and the earth allowing this to happen. So, um, yeah, honestly, uh, they're running a major scam. It's no different than Jerusalem. Jerusalem is just another Judeo-Christian thing. And like I said, there's a reason why they do it the way they do it. It's not random. It's not all made up. It's a copy, a carbon copy, that is attempting to redirect your attention away from the real place to these concocted places, if, if you understand what I mean. So when we look at the black stone, right? This was obviously stolen, right? So... <laughs> was this thing stolen? Of course, no. The actual stone we told in history was stolen and then it was returned at ransom. When we look at this area here, and then we look at this black part right there, we see the same type of structure as in another religion. Okay, Black stone in the middle and this oval type, feminine type shape. around it okay this is in hinduism this this shape right here they could have picked any shape it could have picked a square around it to make it fit with the right angles no they picked the shape of what's called a yoni yoni symbol yoni hand sign this is a feminine goddess shape in hinduism today in yoga in the occult and what do they use for the male part? A black stone. I'm telling you, all of these religions, they're all taking the same. Notice this is from the Vatican. Okay. They're all taking the same. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're copying the same homework of wherever this knowledge comes from, ultimately. Ultimately, all of these traditions, all of these um practices, all of these mythologies, legends, they all have to come to a convergence point. And that's why we see so many similarities with them. Hinduism, many people will say, doesn't have anything to do with monotheism. Okay. And yet, it's obviously very similar. The resemblance is so striking. It's hard to ignore. 
So this is called Shiva Lingam, colloquially in Hinduism, and this is called Yoni. Okay, Yoni shape. You can find it for yourself. I just don't want to show all the images. And notice we have the his we have the cornerstone is where it is. Like I said, they could have put it absolutely anywhere, but they have to put it in the cornerstone here. Just like in Christianity, what do we see? Christianity, we talk, they talk about Jesus Christ being the cornerstone of the church. But in Isaiah, what do we see? Isaiah 28, 16 to 17. The Lord say, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who trusts it will never be dismayed. I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plumb line. Notice, cornerstone, foundation. Remember Ibrahim and the foundation? The cornerstone is also reliable. The one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. The stone, the builders rejected. Who are these builders? Is it these builders? Okay. Um, okay. And it's just interesting that um, we have this concept very, it's eerily similar, eerily similar to this photograph here. Okay. And it has to do with Christianity. It hasn't, doesn't have to do with Islam. So this black stone was placed okay and mind you you can go to the timeline of mecca that they tell you this is all you get this is the position of the eight pieces okay so you better be very accurate if you're going to kiss this because most of it is not the black stone so maybe you might touch the part that doesn't forgive you of any sins automatically without any repentance i was told in islam the real Islam, in the Quran, you repent for your sins. You reform your ways. You don't go to this place that clearly, clearly does not work. Clearly, it's a fabrication. And in part three, we're going to start to look at why they did this and why they're hinting throughout various different outlets what the real place is supposed to look like. So I hope you enjoyed that. And inshallah, part three coming up next. Salam.